Hello once again. This is our third and final briefing of the afternoon on the Alana mission. And here to talk about Alana is Jason Cruzen, the Alana program executive from NASA headquarters in Washington. Garrett Scrobot, the Alana mission manager from the NASA Launch Services program at Kennedy. David Klumpar, the director of the Space Science and Engineering Laboratory for Montana State University and the Explorer One Prime Principal Investigator. James Lump, the director of the Space Systems Laboratory and the KYSAT One Principal Investigator from the University of Kentucky. And Brian Sanders, the research coordinator for the Colorado Space Grant Consortium, and he is the Hermes Principal Investigator from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And we'll begin first with Jason Cruzen. Thank you, George. Um, I wanted to thank you for everybody at, at, to kick everything off here, to take the time with us today to talk about a few details of a new initiative at NASA, uh, specifically the ALANA, the Education Launching of Nano Satellites uh, mission. This is the first element of an overall new initiative called our CubeSat Launch Initiative at NASA. Um, and I wanted to give you a little background of why we're um, even pursuing the CubeSat Launch Initiative. So NASA has many programs um, that fund universities. Um, those come from everything from scientific grants to educational research grants and training grants, such as our um, NASA Space Grant Consortium funding and, and like likewise. The, the universities um, use these various funds um, to develop, obviously to meet their scientific goals of their grants, but also to develop educational training opportunities for students. Um, and a lot of these um, universities, what they've chosen to do is actually develop small satellite programs uh, to achieve those overall education objectives that they have. Um, these small satellite programs allow um, students to actually experience the entire mission life cycle of the spacecraft, everything from instrument design to operations to um, actually hands-on building of the instrument themselves. Um, one of the important missing elements, uh, though, for many of these programs is actually the ability to launch and actually see their project through the end. Um, launch to a lot of folks and the operations and achieving their and getting their scientific results is really the capstone of any kind of mission that, uh, that uh, you can be part of. And this has been missing from a lot of these educational opportunities. So th this flight allows this team to actually see the outcome of the results, both scientifically and the technical developments that they've been trying to achieve. Um, and those, those are very important to see their design choices and see how they play out actually in an operational system. The second aspect is uh, of our CubeSat Launch Initiative is actually to demonstrate that students can lead missions um, that bring significant results, um, be they scientific or technology developments. Um, and these, these results uh, are actually go way beyond just education outputs, but actually real uh, mission values that we get back as an agency. Uh, and what better way to actually conduct education by giving, but by giving the next generation workforce hands-on opportunities, not just classroom-based or lab-based case studies, but real missions that they get to work on today um, and actually see them all the way through flight. Uh, and with that, uh, today you'll hear about uh, our overall Alana mission uh, from my colleagues here and then our individual uh, satellites as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jason. And we'll go now to Garrett Scrobot, the Alana mission manager from the NASA Launch Services Program at Kennedy. Garrett? Uh, thank you, George. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here this afternoon to uh, listen about the Alana briefing and what the NASA initiative for CubeSats will be. Uh, one of NASA's missions is to attract and retain students in the sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or we call STEM disciplines. Creating missions of programs to achieve the important goal helps strengthen NASA's na nation's future workforce as well as engage and inspire Americans and the rest of the world. During the last three years, an attempt to bring back educational spaceflight, NASA generated a new and exciting initiative. The initiative is NASA's Educational Launch of Nano Satellite, or ALANA, which is now in full swing. ALANA missions are the first educational packages to be carried on expendable launch vehicles for NASA's Launch Services Program. These missions contain small auxiliary satellite payloads we call CubeSats. These CubeSats are built by students throughout America from high schools through graduate level. When Glory's T9 mission lights its motors, the first Alana mission will begin its journey as an auxiliary payload. Once on orbit, hundreds of students from around the country will be able to experience the feelings of accomplishment. We are truly launching education in the space. On my next image, 
I'd like to give a little bit of detail on the, uh, the first mission here of Alana. It comprises of what we call three 1U CubeSats. The built, built by Montana State University, Implore One, Explore One Prime, the University of Colorado Boulder Hermes, and Kentucky Space Consortium, uh, KYSAP. The three CubeSats will can be can contain through flight in California Polytech State University, or we call Cal Poly, at San Luis Obispo's Poly Pico Satellite Orbital Deployer, or we call the PPOD. These three cubes, these CubeSats are designed and built by students. The PPOD is built by students, and once separated from the PPOD, the CubeSats will be tracked by students around the world on tracking stations. Next slide, please. This image here represents the integration of the flight PPOD and CubeSats back in November. Now, one of the things the three cubes had to complete, what we call the mission readiness review. Each one of these cubes went through a review process just like a primary spacecraft would do. The students had to get up in front of a NASA team and a Cal Poly team and present their basis of meeting all the requirements for flight. The image on the left shows Hermes on the far left there, little KY sat in the middle, and Explore One Prime on the far right. The other two images are Cal Poly students actually doing the integration of the flight systems, preparing it for flight and final testing. Each one of these CubeSats weighs about one kilogram, or 2.2 pounds, and the complete integrated system weighs about six kilograms. The CubeSats are 10 centimeter cubes, or just over under four inches cubed. Next image. Now, where these uh, cubes will be located with the PPOD, it's on the forward end of the vehicle we call on the third stage. It's attached to the aft ring on the aft end of the uh, Taurus third stage with a mounting bracket that was provided by Orbital uh, to attach it to the launch vehicle. On the next slide, our next image here, is a Orbital technician uh, installing the Alana PPOD on February 6th. This was a big day of accomplishment for a lot of us, and we really uh, took a big sigh of relief when that, when that happened and was all bolted up. The next image shows the uh, s sequence of timing on when the actual separation of the cubes will be. Glory will separate about 13 minutes into flight, and 10 seconds later, the three cubes will eject from the P pod in the direction opposite of that of Glory. Now you may ask why we were going in the opposite direction. Well, our analysis show that by going in the opposite direction, we help and do uh, no recontact to the primary. The whole mission is to basically uh, had no risk to the mission. Uh, the engineering team at KSC did a fantastic job. The Cal Poly team did a fantastic job. Each one of the CubeSat teams did an unreal job on meeting all the requirements that we proposed to them. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to the Glory Project for allowing us to ride along your mission. To all the Atlanta team members that did all the extremely hard work over the, the past three years, and to the senior management team for believing in the Atlanta mission. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Garrett. We'll go now to David Klumpar. He is the Explore One Prime Principal Investigator from Montana State University. David. Thank you, George. I'm pleased to be here today as the representative of a lot of folks who've made this moment possible for us. Um, if we could have the first slide. I represent Montana State University, the Montana Space Grant Consortium, and the Space Science and Engineering Laboratory at MSU. I also represent more than 400 college students uh, who have been touched by our program over the 11 years um, since its founding. Uh, the next slide. More than 125 students have worked on the Explorer One mission alone since 2006. That's five years in the process here. Uh, the photo you're looking at is a group photo of the SSEL team uh, taken recently. Uh, of the 400 or more students who've been touched, I very proudly represent the many who have found, founded successful careers in the aerospace industry and at NASA centers and uh, uh, other government laboratories. I represent our, our many partners and collaborators, 
Uh, without them, this program and the Explore One Prime mission would not have been would not be taking place. The Space Dynamics Laboratory in Logan, Utah, and the Lockheed Martin Enterprise Integration Group, now known as the SI organization, provided substantial assistance. Uh, E1P, as we fondly refer to it, however, receives major support from NASA's Montana Space Grant Consortium. MSGC's founding director, Dr. William A. Hiscock, was our fervent supporter until his recent passing. Bill, I, I know you're watching this week. To all, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, without the tenacity and perseverance of Garrett Scrobot on my right and Larry and Bill, his colleagues at NASA Launch Services Program, Elana certainly would not exist. So I thank you, NASA, and I thank you, Garrett, for making it possible for us to be here today. Uh, and of course, without the Glory mission uh, allowing us to hitch a ride on their rocket, we also wouldn't have been here today. Now let me say a few words about our program uh, and our Explorer 1 Prime mission. Uh, I'm holding in the palm of my hand uh, a CubeSat. Uh, this, is, this is not a scale model. This is full size. Um, it's identical in size to the three CubeSats mounted on the top of the Taurus XL. Each of these 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cubes has all of the fundamental subsystems that any scientific spacecraft requires. It has a power system, it has communication system, these are the antennas, uh, it has an attitude determination system, control, um, telemetry, ground, um, uh, ground contact, and um, uh, command and data handling. Uh, all of that's packed into one kilogram of, of material and silicon. More than 60 CubeSats have been launched um, in the past eight years, and they work. They all work, or they, many of, most of them work, and they're definitely not toys. I, I won't say they all work, uh, considering that they're built to widely spaced universities. Well, one might ask, how could such a small package do anything useful? Um, I'd like to share with you my, my vision, and it's a vision shared by many of my space science colleagues. I'll ask you not to think of the power of just one or two or maybe three of these diminutive satellites, but I'll, I'll ask you to think instead of the potential power of 10 or 20 or 30 or maybe even 50 or 100 nanosatellites distributed as a constellation uh, working synergistically toward a common goal. That's our big vision. Uh, the next slide, I'd like to talk about our students. Uh, for GLORY and virtually all other NASA scientific flight programs, the launch represents the beginning, the data flowing from the, from the mission uh, orbit after orbit, day after day, month after month, um, and the scientific interpretation of that data represent the true end goal. Uh, in contrast, for our program, student hands-on training is, the, is really the prime goal. By delivering an in-house design, built and tested satellite that's fully qualified for space flight, we've basically achieved <coughs> in excess of 95% of our goal. Um, working on space, in space, of course, is the frosting on the cake, and that's why we're all here today. Next slide. Many dozens of students know intimately, though, through direct first-hand experience, as Garrett has pointed out, what is needed now to produce spaceflight hardware. Next slide. Let me repeat that it really is this hands-on student training process getting to the eve of the launch with a fully qualified, space flight qualified satellite that's our primary goal. Now, to be sure, um, our mission has uh, scientific and technical element um, and, and a historical significance as well. Um, just like Glory will, will operate in space, return scientific data, interpret and publish the data. If we could go to the next slide, I'll talk just very briefly about our mission the satellite is named Explorer 1 Prime because of its close relationship to uh, the original Explorer 1 
that carried a Geiger counter experiment produced by Professor James Van Allen at the University of Iowa. That experiment on Explorer 1 led to the discovery of what are now known as the Van Allen radiation belts depicted uh, in the upper left and the, and the right hand side of this visual. Our Explorer 1 Prime is carrying a, an authentic Van Allen Geiger tube, Geiger counter, supplied to us by Van just before he passed away in 2006. So uh, as the slide shows, uh, our orbit will uh, pass through the horns of the radiation belts about four times per orbit. Uh, our experiment will report back the variations in the intensity and location of the radiation belts. These variations are driven by disturbances on the sun that propagate to Earth and jostle the magnetic field that controls the motion of the very energetic electrons and protons that are trapped in the radiation belts. Uh, the next visual shows uh, the radiation belts as seen by the NOAA POSE uh, instruments uh, depicted on a map of the, of the Earth and the yellow bands that uh, represent the, the horns of the radiation belts where we will uh, obtain our, our primary data. So I'll go to the last visual just to conclude with uh, this photograph of our baby that's now sitting out there on the pad um, as it looked just before delivery. We're thrilled to be here, and uh, we look forward with enthusiasm um, uh, to the on-orbit phase of our mission. All right, thank you, David. And now to James Lump. He is the KYSAT-1 principal investigator from the University of Kentucky. James? Thank you, George. Um, good afternoon. I am really happy to be here. I'm really happy to be to this point where our spacecraft is up on top of that beautiful rocket down by the coast. Um, happy to talk to you today a little bit about our satellite and our team, and really proud to represent our team back in Kentucky, um, which includes many dedicated people who have spent a lot of hard work and time uh, bringing this to reality. Um, the team that built KYSAT-1 is, is somewhat unique in that it consists of students from a consortium of public universities across the state um, that we call Kentucky Space. The consortium includes the University of Kentucky, Moorhead State University, Western Kentucky University, the University of Louisville, Murray State University, and the Kentucky Community and Technical College System. Um, as, as Dave mentioned, hands-on experiences like building a satellite are invaluable to engineering, technology, and science students. And really, a hands-on um, educational experience was the focus of our effort throughout that, that kind of set up the way we, we um, organized the team, that we built the subsystems, and even made its way into the concept of operations for the satellite itself, which includes a substantial outreach component for K-12 through education to engage K-12 through students in STEM uh, fields. I'll talk a little bit about that more later, but let me go ahead and, and bring up the first graphic and, and introduce KYSAT-1. Um, the first image shows the picture of the final launch configuration of the satellite as it's currently integrated inside the P-Pod on the Taurus XL. It's a 1U CubeSat. The triangular um, solar cells on all six faces provide power. The golden bands wrapped around the satellite are, in fact, the um, communications antennas. And there's a black circle on the top face there that's the uh, lens of our digital camera. The second image shows the satellite with the solar cells and the frame removed. You can see the stack there. Um, and in this testing, there are black whip antennas in place of the flight antennas. The camera module is visible in the foreground. Um, KYSAT-1 serves as a test bed for several um, satellite bus technologies that we're developing um, to support a variety of, of orbital and suborbital missions. The bus includes a flexible command and data handling system, generic payload interface, and um, extensive health and, and, and status monitoring throughout the satellite that uh, can be programmed in various telemetry modes. The third image shows the satellite in its flight configuration with the antennas deployed. You can see that there's three antennas in the picture. Um, the longer two support a UHF VHF radio system. The short one at the top there um, supports an S band, high bandwidth um, radio system. The UHF VHF radio is, is the primary support for our educational outreach 
and provides beacons, analog and digital beacons for the satellite. And then the S-band um, provides much higher bandwidth communications for uploading audio files for the radio and downloading images, um, larger data sets. The fourth image shows um, on the left the 21 meter parabolic dish at Moorhead State that we'll use to communicate with the S-band radio. And then sort of in contrast on the right is um, an example of a handheld station that can also be used to communicate with KOSAT-1. Um, these images sort of represent the extremes of the ground stations that can contact the satellite. Our UHF downlink radio is, is powerful enough that a modest handheld um, transceiver like the one in the picture can, uh, can receive signals from the satellite. And a handheld radio can even uh, command the satellite using DTMF touch tones to request beacons and, and uh, do things such as, as, as request photographs to be taken. We're working with a network of K through 12 schools throughout Kentucky to make um, handheld ground stations like the one in the picture available to students to go right in their own backyard, their own playground at school and um, command KOS at one. The first video I have here is a sequence of images of the team um, and shows the um, the team and, and some of the operations. Uh, you know, KYS Seven provided a unique workforce development opportunity to train future aerospace engineers. Over the course of the project, many students have worked on the program um, and are graduated and working in the aerospace industry across the country. To support the KYS One mission, we developed infrastructure in Kentucky space schools, including thermal vacuum facilities, uh, vibration facilities, clean, clean room facilities, VHF, UHF, and S-band testing and communications, ground stations. Um, the team also carried out a series of, of high-altitude and balloon missions, suborbital rocket flights, um, and uh, experiments to test subsystems of the satellite. We even had the opportunity to test our antenna actuation system on a NASA sounding rocket in March 2010 in space. Um, the, the, the project has had a big impact, and I'm going to go ahead and, and let the second video queue up, and well, that's queuing up, I'd like to go ahead and, and thank uh, some of the panel. I'd like to thank Jason and his team for making Alana possible. I'd like to thank um, Garrett Scrobot and um, Larry and the team at LSP for all their support and their expertise. Um, the, once the second video starts, um, well, I, I guess let me also thank the Cal Poly team and uh, their support. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll do the thank yous at the end. Sorry about that. The second video shows <laughs> KY set one in orbit. The white uh, image there shows the focal plane of the camera, and you can see we're in a 600 kilometer orbit. Um, the satellite is tracking the magnetic field of the Earth, which does extend into low Earth orbit. So this sped up image kind of shows the satellite nodding as it tracks that magnetic field. Um, you'll see um, in the animation that um, We'll have a, a ground contact coming up here. The yellow shows a ground contact from our station in Kentucky. This is the sixth orbit of the satellite, um, and it's the first pass over the middle of the U.S. It will be the first chance for uh, students at our ground stations to interrogate the um, details of health of the status, uh, health and status of the satellite. Um, so the, the video can play out. So I, I did want to um, thank uh, Garrett and his team, thank uh, the, the group at Cal Poly for their support. We owe a debt of gratitude back to in Kentucky to the con Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation for sort of spearheading the establishment of Kentucky Space, um, NASA Kentucky Space Grant Consortium for their support throughout the years. Um, in, in closing, since the KYSAT-1 effort started, it has really served as a catalyst for several activities that are going on throughout the state. Today, students at Kentucky Space Consortium schools are, are working on a series of small satellite missions. We're operating payloads aboard the International Space Station. Uh, and students are dreaming up uh, many new initiatives, all that, that stem directly from the experience of working on KYSAT-1. Um, the excitement created by the Alana launch and the, the outreach activities that we've established with KYSAT-1 have introduced a whole generation of K-12 through students and college students to opportunities in space. And we look forward to sharing the satellite with the rest of the world as it launches later this week. Thanks, George. All right. Thank you, James. And now to Brian Sanders the Hermes Principal Investigator from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Brian. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out today and hearing a, a little bit about our Alana mission. Um, I'm representing the students from the University of Colorado at Boulder. 
the Colorado Space Grant Consortium and the, the hard work that they've put forth over the past uh, almost five years. Uh, five years ago, we said, we want to build a CubeSat, and we let the students figure out what it is that they wanted to do. They took a look at the community and figured out what are some of the main areas that, at least at that point, uh, needed some more development. Uh, they wanted to take a look at an extensible bus, uh, develop some subsystems that could be used uh, in future CubeSat missions. Um, they wanted to take a look at uh, the environment up there as well, um, take a look and see how their attitude system would perform with a passive uh, attitude system. And one of the, the tall poles, quite frankly, in, in CubeSat missions, especially data-hungry, deep scientific missions, is that communications question. Uh, so we wanted to develop a high-rate data S-band communication system. And most importantly, as what you've heard uh, already from the panel, um, it's really the student impact. If we can go to the first image, please. Uh, students have developed every uh, major component within the, the CubeSat, uh, develop, developing the printed circuit boards, uh, populating the parts, going through the entire life cycle of the project and hardware development. And the next image, please. Uh, this is Hermes on the bench uh, in Colorado. Uh, a little bit uh, before uh, summertime when they were developing all the boards, getting them together into the final checkout and going through the final iterations. Uh, the students are really the ones behind this entirely. There's program managers uh, that are responsible for budgets and personnel. It's really a microcosm for what these students will be doing in just a few short years when they get out into the uh, uh, NASA and industry. And the next picture, please. Uh, they go through the entire development life cycle. Um, they develop the hardware, and in fact, we've taken a lot of lessons learned from this mission and applied it to our upcoming missions that we're really excited about as well, that are CubeSat and, and other small satellite-based uh, missions. In the next slide, please. Uh, they really do get a, a fantastic end-to-end -end perspective. So again, some freshmen might be working on soldering some boards together, testing those out. And as they go through their academic careers, they get more uh, uh, skills through their classes that they can apply to the hands-on projects that they do and, and they eventually end up as juniors or seniors working with hardware in a clean room facility. And the next image, please. Uh, these are pictures, these next three photos are over the past couple uh, months, really over the past year. Uh, in Colorado, we're very fortunate to have some fantastic aerospace community support and um, they've really come through both in terms of technical mentorship uh, debugging and some fantastic test facilities. Uh, in the next photo, uh, this is our humble abode back at the University of Colorado with our bell jar. Um, I love this photo. The CubeSat you can almost see right next to the PM's face, uh, but we have the, the NASA meatball up there proudly displayed. And this is really what helps to inspire a lot of the students is that correlation between NASA and actually launching something that they build into space. In the next image, Again, David had a fantastic human reference, uh, but this really helps to, to show what we're talking about. The CubeSat is a very, very small thing on the top of the vibration drum head. Uh, we were able to go down to a facility that tests uh, huge, huge, huge satellites. And uh, we can say without a doubt that we've been, we are the smallest satellite they've ever tested. Um, and the next image, please. Um, and this is really representing something unique for us as well as we're going to the mission operations phases. Uh, this is our S-band communication system um, just northeast of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the students have put together the ground station, have done a whole bunch of testing, uh, in addition to a UHF and VHF system on top of our uh, building at the University of Colorado. And in the final image, this is our launch team. This picture was only taken about two weeks ago. Uh, these are all the mission operators. Some students are freshmen. Um, that have been understudies for folks that have been around a little bit longer, but it's a fantastic way to get hands-on experience, even at a very early age, to then apply that as you go out into industry. And I like to point out the, the picture at the very bottom. You can see all the pizza boxes. The sun might be the, uh, the driver for uh, the, the solar activities around uh, a lot of what Glory is studying. Uh, pizza is really the, the driver behind what students do. And it's really topped off with the unforgettable experience of, of actually launching something into space. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And we're ready now to take questions. Once again, if you'll give your name and affiliation, and we'll start with Nora. 
Doral Wallace, Santa Barbara News Press. Could you three gentlemen um, speak about how many people you brought with you this week and also financial commitment to um, create your experiment? I'll start. <laughs> Uh, we have about 100 students that have been involved in the program over the past five years. We have 10 students that will be here physically in California for the launch. Um, and a couple, three of our students, uh, the leadership for the team, have been out here for a couple days. Um, one of the great things about CubeSats is they're relatively affordable. Um, the, I'll use a lot of off-the-shelf parts, figure out how to make them available for space. So you're not in the billions or millions. Um, it's really quite affordable, especially for university projects. Um, uh, we have, I believe, seven students here for the launch, um, and um, as, as Brian said, you know, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars on the materials and supplies for a CubeSat um, versus versus millions. So it's it's on the orders of tens, and um, we've been working on ours for about five years as well. And, and probably about 100 students have participated through the years on various aspects of the system. So lots of impact. Uh, the Montana State University official travel team uh, here in California is, uh, is about 11 or 12 people. Uh, we have a number of students who are now in the industry, a lot of them here in Southern California. Uh, uh, it's an uncountable number. I, I don't know how many are actually coming in. Uh, I know that some students are flying in from halfway across the country, former students. Um, I think we might number 20 people by, by the time uh, tomorrow night's launch arrives. Um, uh, the, the cost of building these is, is a little hard to quantify uh, because we depend so much on, on industry collaborators and partners to provide like-kind support and, 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 and uh, get, get involved with us and our students. Uh, it's good for them because they um, they get a chance to, uh, to vet students before they might hire them. And, uh, and it's good for uh, the students because they get to work with professionals and mentors and, and have that industry contact that's uh, so important. Um, so um, um, I'll just leave it at that. Janine Scully, Santa Maria Times, Lompoc Record. How valuable is this? Um, experience for the students to actually do this versus just reading books and writing papers? Oh, I'd like to. That was a little easier to answer. <laughs> yeah. We have a time. <laughs> now that one we can talk about. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's incredibly valuable. Um, I, I, it, it, it's, in so many instances, um, we'll see a student uh, who will who'll design a, a system, make a design, and, and just have so much confidence that it's, that it's going to work that they won't even bother to build it. So, you know, oh, your launch isn't until a month from now. Well, you know, why don't you go ahead and test your system out three years in advance? And what they discover is it doesn't work. A and it's that interactive back and forth that's, oh, my gosh, scratching the head and going back and trying to figure out why. Uh, that's so important. And the other thing that's very important is, is uh, the interdisciplinary nature of the project. So you have a mechanical engineering student, an electrical engineering, a CS student. They come together and they, and they understand each other's worlds a little better, and they understand that they have to give and take in order to satisfy the entire mission systems engineering constraints. So it's just huge. It's just really huge. And if I could add one thing, Dave, on that is working with NASA, We've taken this approach with the students as they have project managers, and these project managers are required to manage the mission and report back to us, and we put them through every one of the review cycles. Um, come launch night, I have three slots for each one of the project managers on console, so they'll be sitting on console experiencing the whole effect. Now, they don't know if I'm going to call them yet or not. We may. <laughs> so, but I think the experience they've, they've experienced over the, the life of the mission, the telecons, the meetings, has been uh, beneficial to them, and it makes them a better uh, manager or engineer for the future. Uh, can you address the lifespan? Or is it the same as Glory? Is it three years? The hardware is built to um, last for a long, a long period of time. Um, for Hermes specifically, we're designed to last for at least six months, if not a year, in terms of primary and, and secondary mission objectives. 
Um, but there's no reason that it can't last for a long time operationally on orbit. And the, the, the orbit life, the orbit life for each of the satellites is probably on the order of 15 years. Um, but then, for us, it'll probably be better battery cycling time. Maybe 18 months, two years would be a great uh, goal for us. I, I just add that um, most of these cubes, uh, none of the ones that are flying tomorrow night, have uh, any consumables. So. Unlike Glory, where they have propellants, and three years from now they may run out, we're, we're, there's no reason to believe these satellites won't work for for years and years. It, uh, one of the technologies that the, the program is set up to do is to try to utilize commercial off-the-shelf parts that you can just buy almost almost locally, literally. And uh, we're trying to understand how those parts can survive in the space environment, and, and we may have some early failures, or, or we may understand that, indeed, uh, low-cost commercial parts that are used in cell phones and everything else are just fine for satellites. Ariel Wessler, uh, KSBY TV. I'm wondering, for the three of you, did you have to work uh, with Cal Poly students to discuss the Peapod that was going to house uh, your satellites? We work very closely with uh, with the team at Cal Poly, uh, an excellent group of students, um, and you know they're real advocates for the CubeSat form factor and uh, work with uh, schools throughout the country to uh, to um, have them build CubeSats. And it was a great experience working with them. Work very closely with them. All right. If we any follow up questions here again in the front. All righty. In that event, uh, that will uh, conclude our briefing. A uh, programming note about our NASA TV launch coverage. It will begin at 12.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesday morning. That's 3.30 Eastern time. And it will conclude after we have deployed both uh, Glory and Alana. So that will conclude our triumvirate of briefings today. Thank you very much.